Well, welcome to Fellowship Church, everybody. Clap your hands if you're glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Turn and tell somebody, I'm so glad I got to sit by you. Turn and tell your second choice. I didn't want to leave you out. I'm glad you're here. My name is Sean Nepstad, and my wife and I pastor this great group of people called Fellowship Church. And a long time ago, God gave us two words for this church, and we like to say them a lot around here just to remind ourselves. Can you shout it out with me, everybody? Come on. Hope and healing. Hope for tomorrow and healing from our yesterday. We're so grateful that God has provided that through Jesus. And if you're here as a first-time guest, we're really glad you're here. And I think we all, one more time, clap your hands for the guests and everybody watching online at home. We love our church family around the globe. And today is a very exciting day because I get to introduce to you somebody who has had such a deep impact on my life as he has on many of yours. And yesterday, we had an incredible day of just training leaders in our community. How many, how, anybody come to that? Anybody, anybody? Wasn't it great? Oh, it was so incredible. So much value added. And if there's one thing that comes to my mind when I think about our speaker, it is he loves to add value to people wherever they are and just help us on our journey. How many know you need some people in your life that can add value to you because God has hidden some of who you are in somebody else? And sometimes the only way it's awakened is when it's inspired. And so this guy has spoken all around the world, I mean, to presidents and so many nations and sold 35 million books, and he has some in the lobby today. The selfish people of first service almost bought all of them, so I know, well, you might have a chance to get some at the, at the end. He'll sign some books for you at the very end of service today, but I wonder, can we all stand to our feet? Come on, Fellowship Church, stand to your feet, and let's give a nice, warm welcome to Dr. John Maxwell, everybody. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Good morning. morning. It is so good to be here. Wow. I just thought of of, of when you were talking, Sean, about your church, the two words, hope and healing. And I I thought that, that I love those words for you because that's what I feel when I'm here. I I feel um, hope for the future, that, that God is still in control. And, and so let's, let's always, let's, you know, I, I think we got to keep reminding ourselves in t- spite of all the adversity and stuff that we're going through that God's, God's, God's God. I'm not, I'm not too worried about him. He'll show up. He'll come through. But, but I also find this a, such a place of healing during worship. I just thought uh, any person that was just wanting to, uh, to know God and, and to sense and feel God, it, he was here. He was here. He was here in the service. And so do you, do, you have, do you have worship like this every week? I mean, it's every, every week? So this just wasn't for me. So you just do it every week. When you go to heaven, you're going to want to come home on the weekends, aren't you? <laughs> huh? I, I mean, I thought to myself how, how wonderful it would be for me to, to live in this area and to be able to come and worship with you and, and sit and listen to Sean and this incredible... The, the people that lead this congregation, they have terrific integrity. They're, they're good people. They're authentic they have a great heart for God. They have a great heart for you. They love you. Uh, I mean, Sean, whenever he's with me traveling or whatever, he, he talks about you. And I kept telling him, they can't be that good. <laughs> so finally, he just said, you're going to have to come and see them and meet them. And Sean, they're that good. <laughs> they're that good. You just did it. And... and He's so gifted and so beautiful. And then he's got Diana and those four girls. In fact, now that I know them and have met them, Sean is the fifth most gifted person in his family. 
Just, you're, yeah. That is, is it six? You're, you're going down, are you? Oh, oh, with, oh, with the son-in-law, you're, you're sliding some more. It, yeah. <laughs> It's like when you know. It's like when we had our first grandchild. You know, you know uh, I was always kind of number one, and then we got a grandchild, and, and I became number two. You know, and three, and now I'm number. You know, I'm number six. You know, grand. You, see, you're all too young. You don't even have grandchildren. You're, you, grandchildren are God's gift to you for not killing your children. <laughs> really. I was with my grandchildren recently and I, over Christmas, and I, I was just telling them they were, they, my grandchildren are just so much better than my children. I mean, they were. I mean, I, I love my children, but my grandchildren are awesome. And so I was just telling them in, in front of their parents that they were better children than, than my children. And my son Joel said, of course they are. He said, we're their parents. It's the last time I'm using that illustration. <laughs> that, that, that one is gone for sure. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, my name's John. I'm your friend. Yeah. On the count of three, give me your name. One, two, three. Yeah. See, nice to meet you. It's really nice to meet you. I'm 75, and um, or just about to be 75, and... One of the, I'm going to talk to you about perspective today, but before I talk to you about perspective, you see, as you, as you get older, you, there's some maturity that happens, and perspective changes, and, and when, when I was, for example, when I was young, I was just kind of certain about everything, and now that I'm older, I'm not near certain about as much as, as I was then, and, and I'll, in fact, I'll talk about that in a moment, but, but I, want to, I, just, I just want to take a moment, because you're so young. Uh, and I want to explain life to you because we all have questions about life and, you know, what's our purpose and how do we find it, et cetera. And, and so what happens is, is as you get older, here's what you need to know. When you turn 65, you get wisdom. Okay? So you, and some of you have a, a really long wait. You, you get with, now, when you're young, you get energy. God, God gives you energy when you're young but no wisdom. And then when you get old, he gives you wisdom and, and, and no energy. And he's just cracking up. You know what I'm saying? He, and, and so understand, so I'm going, to, I'm going to read you something that you're going to love, and, it, it, and, and it's all about life. It, this, if you have any questions on life, I'm just about to clear them up for you, okay? That, that's my name. That's my job, okay? So I'm going to clear it up for you. So look at your neighbor and say, you're about to understand life. Tell them that. You're, you're about to understand life. In fact, look at them and say, why do you think I brought you here? Okay. So, so here we go. I'm going, I'm, this, this is just going to clear life up for you. How you doing today, Sean? Nice to see you. Good to have you back. You sat over there yesterday. I brought your gift here. Oh, did you bring my gift? Oh, my gosh. Sean, you took here. Yeah, Sean, thank you. Sean brought me. Yeah. Look at this. This that's Mark. Oh, that's Mark Cole, who's our, the CEO of the John Maxwell. All of our companies. Give him a hand. Thank you, Mark. Good. Um, Thank you, Sean. I know they probably spoiled you with those, but... I, no, there's... There's nothing better than peanut butter chocolate. Come by. And, and, and I'm going to keep him here. Don't anybody come near this table. <laughs> Yesterday you sat right there. Good to see you. Did you pay a little bit more to get this seat right here? <laughs> oh, you just got in a little quicker. Just walked right in. Okay, okay. So here we go. This is, I'm going to explain life to you right now. Are you ready? On the first day, God created the dog, said, sit all day by the door of your house and bark at anybody that comes by. I'm going to give you a 20-year lifespan. 
dog said, that's too long to be barking for 20 years. Give me 10 years and I'll give you back the other 10. And God agreed. On the second day, God created the monkey. God said, entertain people, do monkey tricks, make them laugh. I'm going to give you a 20-year lifespan. The monkey said, how boring. Monkey tricks for 20 years? I don't think so. The dog gave you back 10 years, so that's what I'll do too, okay? God agreed. So on the third day, God created the cow. God said, you must go out in the field with the farmer all day long, suffer under the sun, have calves, give milk to support the farmer. He said, I'm going to give you a lifespan of 60 years. The cow said, that's kind of a tough life to live for 60 years. Let me have 20 and I'll give you back the other 40. And God agreed. So on the fourth day, God created man. He said, eat, sleep, play, marry, enjoy your life. And I'm going to give you 20 years. Man said, what? O- only, only 20 years? I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll take my 20. Give me the 40 the cow gave you back. The 10 the monkey gave you back. The, the 10 the dog gave you back. That makes 80. Okay, okay, God. He said, you got a deal. So that is why the first 20 years of our lives, we eat, sleep, play. You're good, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, you're just good. You just, you just catch on so quick. You're so good. First 20 years of our lives, we eat, sleep, play, marry, enjoy our lives. The next 40 years, we slave in the sun to support our family. For the next 10 years, we do monkey tricks to entertain the grandchildren. <laughs> For the last 10 years, we sit on the front porch and we bark at everybody that goes by. (laughs) Yeah. You've just had life explained to you, haven't you? How much fun. I told you a moment ago that when I was younger, I, I just, you know, I had a lot of certainties. I have a lot less today. When, when I was young, I just had answers for you. Just uh, give me a question, I give you an answer. I was kind of like Mr. Answer Man. And I was pretty amazing. I wish you would have known me. I was amazing then, really. Just, <laughs> well, just amazing. And I started off as a pastor. And, and um, before Margaret and I had children, I preached some of the most incredible messages on raising children. <laughs> and then we had a child. And it, it all went out the window. You, you, you see, one of the things that happens with maturity is, is you see a bigger picture. And when you see a bigger picture, your, your perspective, you know, it really changes. And, and perspective is huge. Honestly, outside of sharing my faith with you in this room, if you and I could just sit down and we could talk, what I would love to do more than anything else, if I could, is I would love to help you get what I would call a, 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 just a, a mature perspective about life. Because this is true. Here we go. How we view things is how we do things. So, when I see a person's behavior, I realize that the source of that behavior is their perspective. And so, if our perspective is really good, there are some wonderful things that can happen from it, just as if our behavior is not so, you know, good, uh, there are some things that just don't turn out really well. And so, as I have grown and as I've matured, I've had a a real passion to help people get, for example, a good perspective about God. Because that's the world that I live in. 90% of my time, I'm in the business secular community, and, and what I've come to the conclusion is, is, is that people want to know God, they just have a bad picture of him, and, and because they have a bad picture of him, they don't know him, and, and so I, I go around trying to help them get the, a, a, a good perspective of who God is, and what I discovered is the moment people really see God as he truly is, 
they think, well, yeah, I would love to have a relationship with him. I mean, I mean, when you think about it, would you love to be forgiven of all your sins? Yes. I mean, would you like to have uh, uh, someone who, who sticks closer to you than a brother relationally? Of course you would. Would you, would you love to have somebody that gives you peace that the world can't give and it can't take? Of course, of, of course. In fact, during COVID, I've just, this has been a, it's been a bad time, but it's been a very good time. What's really sad to me during this difficult time is that during this bad time, Christians haven't made it a good time. Oh, my. So when people come and they talk to me because I'm in that world all the time, and they talk about fear, they're fearful. And I say, well, I understand. It's a very difficult time in life. And then I look at them and I just smile and I say, I, w- I wish you had my faith. And they say, well, what do, you, what do you mean? I say, well, I'm not fearful. Well, what do you, what do you mean you're not fearful? Well, I, 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 I'm not plagued with the fear that you have. Well, how can that happen? It's, it's, it's my relationship with God. That, that he is my source. And, and that regardless of circumstances and situations, are you seeing where we're going? Yeah. And they people that say, well, you know, I, you know, I wish, you, I, you know, I, I, I'm tired. Well, I wish you had my strength. And, and it, it's, it, by the way, we have missed the greatest opportunity to let our light shine that I have known in my lifetime because we have become like them very, very sad. We haven't had the positive difference that's attractive to them. In this culture, in this time, during this difficulty, during this darkness, lost people should be flocking to God. But why would you flock to God when Christians are huddled in fear themselves? The great early church father, Tertullian, looked at the Christian community when they began acting like the world. And he asked them why they did, and they said, well, because we must live. And he looked at him and he said, must you live? Honestly? Is this as good as it gets for you? Is there not another kingdom? Okay, okay. I could do a whole teaching on this this morning. I can't. That, this isn't the message at all. And it's, but I, I'm here, and it's, and it's your fault. <laughs> what well, is? It's totally your fault. It's not mine. You're, you're, you're so receptive. You're hanging on every word. You're easy to teach. If you were like some places I go, I could be done with my sermon by now. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about possessions. Let's talk about our perspective of possessions and let's do the story of the Good Samaritan because it's a wonderful story. It's on your screen. An attorney had come to Jesus and asked the question, who is my neighbor? Here we go. In reply, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers and they stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him, and the next day... He took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense that you may have. So then Jesus asked the lawyer this question. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of robbers? The expert in law replied, the man who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. I want to talk to you about four perspectives of possessions. The first three are in this story. First of all, let's look at the the robber. 
And what was his perspective about possessions? Here we go. Number one, what is yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. Now, that's how a robber thinks. He saw the guy coming, walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he said, I think I'm going to beat him up, but I'm going to take his stuff. Now, the moment that I introduce this perspective to all of us in the room today, we look at that and say, well, thank God that's not me. Now, it may be the person beside you, but it's not you, (laughs) of course. Now, let me help you with this. When we were born, we were all born robbers, all of us. That, That incredible selfishness, that it's mine kind of a spirit. I mean, just look at a little child and, and, and how they think. They, you know, uh, they, they just, what's yours is theirs. And they're, they're going to take it. I, I brought with me today this little piece. I love to read property law from a toddler's perspective. If I like it, it's mine. If I could take it away from you, it's mine. If I had it a while ago, it's mine. If I say it's mine, it's mine. If it looks like mine, it's mine. If you're having fun with it, it's mine. If you lay it down, it's mine. If it's broken, it's yours. That's a toddler, isn't it? See, we're all born robbers. We're all born robbers. Now, now, hopefully, as we get a little older, six, seven, eight, we start to grow, we start to get a little bit of maturity, and we begin to understand that this perspective is not the perspective that we want throughout our life. Many times when somebody's immature, imm- immaturity is, is the inability to see things from anyone else's perspective. That when, you, when you see an immature person, honestly, they just don't see both sides. And by the way, our, our dysfunctional, ridiculously dysfunctional culture today is highly immature. I, I, I would have personally never believed that we could have gone so stupid so quick. And some people, it's almost like a spiritual gift in their life. But as you mature, you begin to see things from another perspective. You follow me? And sometimes somebody will say, well, they're very young, and, and you know, wait till they get some age on them, and they'll mature. And that's not necessarily true. I know some people, they're getting older, they're getting age on them, but ma- maturity's not coming along. So, so th- that's, it's robbers, what's, what's mine, is, what's yours is mine, I'm going to take it. We, we don't want to go there. Let's go to perspective number two. This will make us, this, this will kind of connect with us more than one. Most of us are out of the robber mindset, okay? Most of us are. If you have to be beside someone that isn't, watch and pray. Number two is um, what is mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. That's, that was the perspective of the priest and the Levite, because as they were going down the road, Jesus wants to make sure that we both know that they saw the man. They saw the person. They saw the situation. It was not that they were unaware, but it was that they wanted to be, they didn't want to be inconvenienced. Listen to me very carefully. The mark of a selfish person is they don't want to be inconvenienced. Just as the mark of immaturity is I don't have the ability to see anyone else's perspective, the mark of a selfish person is, I, you know, I, I, I don't, it's mine. I, I don't want to be inconvenienced. I had a wonderful friend of mine. His name was Ron. And took his, his nine-year-old son loved McDonald's French fries. Now, let's just stop here for a moment. Who doesn't love McDonald's? I mean, when those babies are hot, just freshly salted, you, they hand those to you, that smell, you put one in your mouth, getting a little hungry. He took him, he took him to, because his son one Saturday morning wanted some fries, so he took him to McDonald's, bought him the fries, sat at the table, and as he's sitting at the table, of course, you can smell those suckers. And he's looking at them, and he's smelling them, and, you know, how long is it going to take before 
you're ready to go over and, you know, you know, just pick it. He just reached over to just get a couple of fries, got his hands just on, 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 on those fries, and his son grabbed his hand and smacked it away and said, you can't have any of those fries. Those are mine. Yeah. And Ron said, I just kind of pulled my hand back, and, and I was kind of hurt and surprised at the behavior. And he said, immediately as a father, three thoughts came to me. Number one, he doesn't understand where those fries come from. I'm the source. Without me, he's not eating fries. I'm the one that put him in the car. I'm the one that drove him to McDonald's. I'm the one who bought the fries. I'm the one. I, I'm the source. He doesn't know. When he had that selfish, these are my fries, he doesn't know. He doesn't know I'm the source. And secondly, he doesn't know that I have the power to take those fries from him. Sure. I can look at him and say, if you're going to have that kind of selfish attitude, you get no fries on Saturday morning. I, I, I have, I'm the father. I can take those fries from him. Or he said, if I really wanted to, because I'm the authority, the power, if I want to, I can go back up to that, up to that counter and I can order 100 packs of flies. Right, just give me a hundred packs of those fries, and I can, I can just pour fries all over his body. I can just, <laughs> I can, I can bury him in fries. And as soon as he talked about burying his son in fries, I thought, oh my, wouldn't it be wonderful? I, what a way to go. How did you die? Well, I was in McDonald's one day. Just, just backed up a whole load of fries and buried me in fries. And I just started eating. And a couple people tried to rescue me, and I smacked them and went. <laughs> he said, I'm the source. I, I, I got the authority. I got the power. He said, the third thing, he said, my, my son doesn't understand this all. It's, it's, truly, I don't need his fries. I have the ability to get up. I can go to the counter. I can order my own fries. Right. Then he said, what bothered me as a father is he didn't want to share them with me. And when he told me that illustration, I thought of this, I, I thought of, of, this, of this mindset, this perspective of what is mine is, is mine. And, and I'm going to keep it. You know, the proverb writer said, a generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Yeah. I feel so sad for selfish people. I feel so sad for you because if you're selfish, you consistently miss out on something that's much bigger than your scarcity mindset. It's, this is huge. You know, selfish people are never happy. They never have enough. I had a person the other day come up to me, literally after I finished speaking, and said, I just want you to know, I, I don't have a sp selfish bone in my body. <laughs> and I just looked at him and said to myself, you, you don't have a realistic bone in your body. Right. <laughs> it's just very difficult talking to delusional people all the time. You say, well, I don't think I'm selfish. Of course you are. We're all selfish. We're born selfish. If you don't think you're selfish, let me just ask you a simple question. The next time you're in a group picture with your friend, <laughs> and they take that picture, let, now just let me ask you a question. When you see all those people, who is the first person? <laughs> Come on, who's the, who's the first person? You just, you, I mean, you me, you look right for yourself, don't you? I mean, you bypass those nine people like they're not even there. You go, you know, and you hone down on yourself, and if you look good, you say, ah, great picture, great picture. Great. Send it to me. Yeah, oh, send it, send it. Great picture. And, and if you don't look good, 
Oh, do it again, do it again, do it again. Here, here. Do it again, do it again, do it again. You judge everything based on you. And you're not selfish? Of course we are. Here's what you need to know about this perspective. You not only hurt others with your selfishness, you hurt yourself. You lose the opportunity of significance. You see, significance is all about others. Significance is adding value to other people and making a difference in their life. I've known many unhappy, successful people. I've never met anyone unhappy that was significant. So these two people, the priest and the Levite, who said, really, what's mine is mine. I'm going to keep it. I'm going on down to Jericho and have lunch. They have no idea of the fulfillment that they lost because they didn't want to be inconvenienced. Perspective number three. This is the good Samaritan's perspective, and, and this is kind of what we all hope to be. This is, this is an upgrade. The, the, the perspective of the good Samaritan is, is what is mine is yours, and I'm going to give it. In other words, when he came down the road toward Jericho and he saw that the, this guy had been beaten up, instead of crossing the other side like the priest and the Levite, immediately he, he went over to him and said, oh my gosh, I, I've, I've got to help him. That's, this is why he's called the Good Samaritan, because he did good works. And he did good works because he had a good perspective. A good perspective will help you to do good works. Now, in this story, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, they all saw the problem, and they all, had, they all saw the opportunity, and they ha all had a reason not to help. But they also all had a reason to help, but only one did. And the reason that the person helped was not because the plight of the person that had been beaten up was so bad. It was the perspective of how he saw that person. Don't miss this. When people's needs are unmet, it's not that they lack needs. It's that we lack the right perspective to meet them. See, when Sean shared with us in the last service that I think your congregation last year gave well over, well over $1 million for meeting other people's needs and caring and sharing and, and, and giving and serving and loving, I thought, no wonder God blesses this church. And I want to stop and thank you very much because in my nonprofit organization where we train leaders around the world, you help us. And I, I, you know, I'm here, this is kind of like a, a thank you tour. And I'm thanking you. I'm thanking you for your kindness, for your, for your generosity, for you, for you helping us lift the load. But the reason that you do that, the reason that you're generous is because you have this perspective. What is mine is, is yours. And, and, and I'm going to give it. And, and that is, that is just a, that's just the way that we want to see life. Now, as I, as I stop for a moment, we all think, wow, John, I thought you were going to talk about four perspectives. What perspective could be better than the Good Samaritan? And that is what is mine is, is yours, and, and I'm going to give it. There's a higher perspective. In fact, if you take this perspective, you could become the Great Samaritan. Let me give it to you. This is about to change your life. Because you're very good people. And you really want to do good. But perhaps you've never seen this until just now. And it's just going to take you up a little higher. How, how many of you want to go up just a little higher? Huh? You want to just want to kind of improve. You want to do it, don't you? I can see this. I can. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Here's the fourth perspective about possessions. What is mine is not mine. And I'm going to manage it. Oh, my. What is mine, in other words, my stuff, my possessions, really, they're not my stuff. It's not my possessions. If, if, if what is mine is not mine, then let me ask you the question, whose is it? 
it's his. That's why, that, that's why the psalmist would say the earth is the Lord's, everything in it, and the world and all who live in it. In other words, the psalmist got it right. He said, we have to understand God is the source. It's all his. It's all his stuff. We came in the world naked. We go out naked. We came in the world without anything. We leave the world without anything. We, we just have a brief period of time to manage not my stuff. I manage his stuff. Sean was telling me a few weeks ago, he preached a message here, and, and he gave somebody $100 before the message. And, and, and while he preached the message, he asked for the $100 back, and they, of course, came right up there and handed it to him. And, and, and you know, everybody was saying, wow, why, what, what happened there? Why did they do that? Well, the person that gave him the $100 in the service understood it wasn't his $100. Sean, how many of you remember that message? Seven. Boy, I missed a golden opportunity, didn't I? <laughs> wow. Next time I'll do that for you and show you how that thing really works. You won't forget mine. Trust me. <laughs> but, but sure, the guy comes right, out of the, comes right out of the auditorium and he hands the $100. Now, why was he so quick to hand $100 back to Pastor Sean? Because it wasn't his money. Don't miss this. If at any time, you're having a hard time serving people, giving, being generous, helping. If at any time you feel yourself just kind of wanting to kind of say, wait a minute, this is mine, and I, do I want to give this away? You see, when you, as soon as you ask the question, do I want to give this away, you're operating in the wrong assumption that it's yours. Wow. It isn't yours. Right. It's his. See, the moment I know it's his, Generosity is a joy. God will only give to you what he knows will flow through you. You're, you and I, we are to be a river, not a reservoir. God doesn't give us this stuff for us to hoard it or hold on to it or, or kind of basically say, well, this is mine. And No, no, no. He, he gives it to us. He, he blesses us to be a blessing to others. The moment we get this perspective, everything changes. If, if you and I went down I don't know, UPS said, we, we've, we've got a package here. We want to deliver it to a friend overnight. Overnight, this package to a friend. And we filled out all the information, and we gave him that package. And so the next day, we called our friend and said, hey, did you get the package? And they said, oh, no. What package? Well, I, I said, a package yesterday. It was supposed to be delivered by now. You, you didn't get the package? No, I, no, there's no package here. Oh, my gosh. We go back down to the place we gave the man the packet. We walk in. We look and say, do you remember me? He said, oh, yeah, you were in last night. Yeah. He said, he said you brought a package. Yeah. You, 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 you didn't deliver it. And the guy looks at us and says, oh, my. I thought that was for me. I, oh, my. I took it home. And, Open it up. I was getting ready to say thank you. And we want to say, oh, no, excuse, excuse, excuse me, excuse me. You're the, you're the delivery person. Can I tell you something? When it comes to possessions, John Maxwell is God's delivery boy. I'm the delivery boy. I, I'm the one that when he blesses me, I just turn around and say, well, who do I bless this with? And who do I pass this on to? And how can I help people? And how can I add value to people? And how can I make a difference in their lives? This, this perspective about possessions will change your life. This is the new year. New year. So I just want to encourage you, challenge you. 
Let's make this year a, a year where our perspective is what's mine isn't mine. And I'm going to steward it. I'm going to, I'm going to manage it. If that's the case, you'll bless the church with your giving. You'll bless people with your giving. You will be a fountain of generosity to people, and you'll make a difference. Thanks for listening. God bless you. You're beautiful people. Come on, church. Can we just really thank Dr. John Maxwell for that incredible word? Thank you so much. Just... No, you have, you don't just teach this. <laughs> He's going to break it and multiply it, guys. Yeah, we lost that one. That was, there you are. look at God. There you are. There you are. Here I am. <laughs> God bless. Love you so much. Love you, brother. Grab your seats for just a second. He's not only teaching it, he models that. He lives very open-handed. And you think about the people you want to be like when you grow up. They are never the people who are stingy and are living for themselves. The people you look up to are those who lay down their life for others. And in this season, we have a consistent God. What the world needs is a consistent church. A church that loves unconditionally that serves sacrificially, that gives generously. And again, thank you because of your generosity. Because you are Good Samaritans, last year, you ready to clap for this? You gave away $1.2 million around the globe. Locally, Nash planting churches, digging water wells, orphanages, shelters. I mean, the list goes on and on. Anti-human trafficking just so many organizations that you gave to because we can do more together than we could do alone. Yeah. Amen, everybody. I'm so grateful for this moment. I, I've been, he's been asking to come for the last two years and we've been kind of closed, you know? I said, I, wanna, I want you to come at the right moment and we felt like this was it and yesterday he added so much value to so many people and in just a moment I'm gonna release you but I wonder, can you just close your eyes for a moment and ask God, what are you trying to say to me in this moment? What are you speaking to me? Because oftentimes we can hear a sermon and then we leave. Now, sermons don't change people's lives. It's the response to the sermon. What is God tapping you on the shoulder to do, say, be? What steps is he asking you to take? Because we don't want you just to be inspired. We want you to move into action. You're an incredible leader. God wants to help you. And over the next several weeks, we're in a series called Develop. We're gonna help you develop as a stronger leader. It's our heart. But maybe you're here today and you say, Sean, my life isn't really what I would call right with God. What do I do? Or maybe you were once close to God and you've drifted away, you strayed. Well, join the club, man, we all have. But how wonderful is the grace of Jesus that Jesus has done everything necessary for us to be made right with him. He died in our place, paid for our sin. He's offering you the free gift of salvation as we place our faith in him alone. And I want to give you a, an opportunity to pray a commitment prayer right here in your seat. You don't have to stand. You don't have to come to the front. I don't want to embarrass you. I just want to connect you to God, all right? So if you're watching online or if you're in this room and you say, Sean, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I need a fresh start. Or I need to recommit my life to God because I have strayed. On the count of three, could you just lift up your hand and say, count me in that prayer, Sean, when you pray it. You ready? One, two, three. Just lift it up and leave it up. Yes, 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 keep clapping because every yes is a hand. Yes, 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 yes. There's so many hands we can't count them. And every hand represents a soul that God is passionately in love with. Listen to me, and we love you too. And now, just as a pastor gives the words to a married couple at a wedding ceremony to the bride and groom, they make those words their own. I'll give you the words to pray. Can you just make these words your own and mean it right to the heart of God? 
Just say this, Heavenly Father. Come on out loud. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me first. Today I give you my life. Forgive me from my sin. Wash me clean. Be my Lord and Savior. From this day forward, I will follow you. Oh, would you just lift your hands as a sign of surrender to the Lord? You don't have to lift them high. Just on your lap. Just say, say this. Say, take all my gifts. Use them to reach others with your love. It all belongs to you. And I'm here for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can we clap our hands for everybody who prayed that prayer? So proud of you. Watching online, many of you prayed that as well. Do me a favor. Take the connection card that's in the seat back in front of you. Take that out real quick. Front row, back row, it's under your chair. And just, if you're a, a regular attender, put your name and email. That's all we need. On your way out, you could drop them in the offering boxes as you leave. But if you just prayed that prayer, which several of you did, check the box that corresponds with the decision you just made. I'm giving my life to Christ or I'm rededicating my life to Christ. Now listen to me. Nobody hits the home run and doesn't run the bases. Don't make the biggest decision of your life and then do nothing. We want to help you take the steps. We have something called a growth track class. Give us three weeks of your life. Would it be worth it to give three weeks of your life to discover purpose? Come on. So it starts the beginning of the next month in February, Sunday during every service on the other side of that wall or online at 10 o'clock. It's a chance to join the church, hear the vision of the church. We'd love to meet you and give you an elbow bump and hear your story and this is, where, this is where that can take place. And then you learn the vision and the values of our church. Jump in and run with us. And then you need a small group. This is a large group. A group that's small is also called a small group. You need that too. And those start February the 20th. Now look at me, everybody. You need to let us know by next Sunday if you want to lead a small group. They could be about basketball or Bible study or scrapbook. But you're running with people going the same way as you. So let us know on that connection card today if that's your heart. And then get on our dream team. Listen, because you'll never even know what purpose feels like until you're making a difference in somebody else's life. You need this more than we need this. We all want to fulfill the call of God on our life. And let's not be the, the people that pass other people by. Let's be that good Samaritan. Let's, get, let's be the great Samaritan. When I, amazing. As we give today, I want to thank you. On behalf of all the recipients the people's lives that will be in heaven because of the gifts that you've given. Here, you planted 64 churches last year in America. We have 74 ready to go this year in America. You've given locally to shelters and programs here in the Bay and around the globe. That was last year. What could we do this year? Uh, with our consistent giving, our tithe, you can text it in, you can give online. There's offering boxes on the back wall. You can even give stock and crypto if you want to on our website and miss out on the capital gains tax that our uncle likes to take from us. Smile at me. But we just want to help you make the biggest difference possible. So I'm grateful for you. Don't miss as we start 20, uh, 14 days of fasting and prayer today. This is the first day. Go back and watch the sermon from last Sunday because I kind of expound upon what prayer is and fasting. Some of you have never fasted before. Listen, it's a very New Testament principle and a value that we're beginning to do today. There's different types of fasts, so don't freak out. There's a, a Daniel fast. You can do fruits and vegetables, whole grain stuff. We just take out all the fun stuff like the desserts and the chocolate chip cookies and the Reese's peanut butter cups that were given to me. That's a temptation right there, and they took it away for the glory of God. Get behind me. That's what I said. I'm doing, I'm doing liquids only, uh, but you can do whatever you want. All I'm saying is, let's push back the plate. Let's give the year to God. Let's say, Lord, we need direction. We need wisdom. We need favor. We need to find out where you're blessing. And it's intentional. The time we would be spending eating and devouring food and social media, let's pray. Let's worship more. And Monday through Friday, we have 6 a.m. prayer right in this room. Some of y'all ain't never seen 6 a.m. Listen to me. Tomorrow morning, we'll be here praying before you go to work or school. Let's pray together. It'll be online as well. But let's pray. Let's really be serious about giving God the first year. And he blesses where he's first. Amen, everybody.